Snacking Benjamins is not for everyone. Side effects may include euphoria, increased ability to meet your goals, and aggression from people wondering, quote, what the hell your secret is. Snacking Benjamins may be habit-forming, especially if you stick around for the entire episode. Wink, wink. Please check with your doctor to see if Snacking Benjamins is right for you. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and happy Aviation Day, Stacker. Today, we'll lift you up so you can soar with your money, basking in the sun of your financial future, all of your hopes and dreams in front of you will literally be the financial wind beneath your wings. Oh, that kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Hey, did I mention John Hope Bryant is here? Talk about flying high. We'll skydive into financial literacy with this iconic leader. But before that, what's up with these financial markets lately? It's like the propeller's stuck and everyone's running for the parachutes. So what do you do after a thousand point drop in the Dow Jones? You listen to today's headline segment. That's what you do. But even better, I'm going to regale you better than the pretzels and Sprite on a flight across the country with my trivia. And now, two guys who are ready to apply the throttle on this episode. It's Joe and O J J J J G. Hey, happy Monday, stackers. So happy you're here with us. Sit back, relax. It is time for, man, we got a good one today. And you know what? The best part of every Monday is sitting across the card table from OG. You say that with so much enthusiasm. <laughs> with um, OG, I guess. And emotion. I and... kept a straight face for as long as I could. How are you, man? How are you? I'm having a case in the Mondays. You are having a case of the Mondays. It looks like it. Yep. We're going to turn that frown upside down, OG. You know why? Because John Hope Bryant is here. Maybe my Legit. favorite American activist. You know why I like John Hope Bryant? Because he's a financial activist. How many financial activists are there? Right. But you go to his Wikipedia page and it says American businessman, entrepreneur, financial activist. Financial activist. That's what John Hope Bryant does. He's talking financial literacy for all. Even you, OG, even you can have financial literacy. Kind of need it. I believe that. We can all use that. Every time John Hope Bryant's been here, you know, we all leave the basement with our hands held high. So he's going to cure the case of your Mondays. All right. Doug, you had something? No, I'm just still stuck on Sprite and pretzels. Like, is that your go-to on a plane, really? Yeah. You know what? The only time I ever have Sprite and pretzels is on an airplane. That is psycho. I'm not a big fan of Sprite. Yeah. Don't particularly care for pretzels. But on the plane... Um, really, it's the Sprite and the Biscoff cookie. Who am I kidding? Oh, I mean, that's, that's the go-to. Load up on the sugar. OG, straight vodka when you're flying? Yeah, probably. Duh. Okay. When I'm flying? No, no, no. Water. <laughs> I thought I'd catch him there. <laughs> FAA, are you listening? <laughs> He's just one hand in it. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't spill his drink. He's got the handle a pop off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing it down. The Eagle's landing. That's not good. You know what is good is uh, obviously with John Hope Bryan coming up, we got to get to him. We've got a great show. We've got a fantastic headline. We're going to have John Hope Bryant first because he's talking financial literacy. And then you know what? We'll practice financial literacy. We're going to help you with your headline after that. And a call from a stack crew said, I better call Saul, see hi, and OG. But uh, before all that, we've got sponsors who make sure that this show is free for you. Uh, we've got a couple now that we're off and running. John Hope Bryant. Waiting in the wings. Let's say hello. I'm super happy. I, I get so pumped every time he's back. John Hope Bryant with us. How are you, man? I'm deeply honored. I'm, uh, you know, one thing people are not today is bored. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's somebody... what, is there something going on in America? Is there anything going on, John? Somebody said yesterday that. There are decades where it seems like nothing's happening. And then there are days when it feels like decades are happening. And yeah. I think we're in the latter at the moment. If you want to feel relevant, if you want to feel like you're living in a moment in history, if you want to feel like everything you do matters, including your vote, this is that time. I mean, whatever you want to hire an intern, it's going to matter. 
you you want to start a program or a nonprofit or you want to fight for your rights or somebody else's rights, it's going to matter. You want to raise children who are going to be consequential to the future of America. Well, that time is now. We were just talking about children role modeling these so-called adults are acting like children who are running for office. And do we really want our children listening to all this foul stuff and basically having people act like children who are supposed to be adults? But whatever you're doing right now, it's obvious to everybody. It's consequential. Look at the environment. This is not 50 years from now. Alaska and, and that whole region is melting right now. <laughs> the weather's changing right now. We've got so many things, no matter what the issue is, it's on the ballot. I don't mean like literally on the ballot, but it is, it's on the table for a decision. And us making these decisions, artificial intelligence, <laughs> it will change 50 years in the next five. If you want to make a difference and be the difference, this is your time, which is why I wrote this book, Financial Literacy for All, which I'm glad to say now is a, a national bestseller. I saw that. Nice work. Thank you, because I believe this is a civil rights issue of this generation. And I think that if Dr. King was alive today, this would be the work he'd be doing. Well, let's get into that because there are a bunch of stackers. You know who listens to financial programs. You've been on CNBC a bajillion times, John. You know people that watch that stuff are people that are not necessarily who people like you and I are trying to reach. They're people that are fairly good with money. They find it fun to talk about, to get in the weeds around all this stuff. And I know there's a bunch of our stackers out there saying, because I want to make this real for them, that they're saying, you know what? I love hearing John Hope Bryant. I love this message. But this isn't my problem. This is somebody else's problem. And I'd like to help, but it's not my problem. That's not true. <laughs> let's, well, well, let's tell our stackers. Let's start there. Yeah. Why is it my problem, John? Well, uh, by God, I, I can answer that a half dozen different ways. Let me do a couple. Even my rich friends need my poor friends to do better if only to stay rich. This economy is the largest economy on the planet, the biggest economy the biggest GDP, the sole superpower in the world, 70% driven by consumer spending, not wealthy people, not rich people, not the stock market, by consumer spending. And 70% of most Americans are living from paycheck to paycheck. If you're making $100,000 today, even, you know, if this was just a poor person's book or a poor person's issue, I think it would not get any attention. But if you're making $100,000 a year today, 50% of those people are living from paycheck to paycheck. You're making $250,000 a year today. And a third of those people making two fifty dollars a year are living from paycheck to paycheck. You live in Manhattan. You're listening or watching this from Manhattan. Let me hit home. You make $100,000 a year. It feels like $39,000 a year. Can I get an amen? And I'll go one step further. I'm going to go really radical here. If someone happens to be racist and they go, you know, I really don't care about any of this stuff. It doesn't relate to me at all. And I'm proud to be a racist, which is your right. If you support a Black person or the Black community to become successful, which is the opposite of the current argument today around diversity, equity, and inclusion, et cetera. But let, we're going to put that aside for a moment. You support a Black person to be successful, even the racist wins, because GDP rises. For the first time in history, and, and I just issued a pamphlet today that is a companion to the book Financial Literacy for All called The Business Plan for America. You people can go to the website, look at the stats and the facts. But God has a sense of humor, Joe, because for the first time in history, you have a nation that is within 10 years a majority of minorities. You have a nation that today is the first time in history where the majority of people are over 65 in our lifetime. Those over 65 are baby boomers, read white, wealthy, prominent, older, trying to retire. They want to go play golf. They want to travel. God bless them. That's their right. They're trying to leave the stage of economic activity and wealth creation. But you got folks who are the farm club, the G League, the, the NFL farm team, the NBA farm team, the baseball farm team. They're trying to come on the stage. It's 40% of their population. They assume 50% plus, and they have been given no tools whatsoever on how to continue to drive the largest economy on the planet on income creation and income growth and wealth creation. And if they don't do that, we're going to be rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic. The ship is sinking. We'll be picking drapes. God has a sense of humor. We're all in this thing together. For the first time in history, demographics are destiny. I'll say it even more pointedly. There are not enough college-educated, successful white men 
to drive GDP for the next 30 years. And that's not a racial comment. I'll repeat. Let's assume you killed, somebody said, oh, let's kill diversity, equity, inclusion. By the way, the phrase is dead. DE and I has been so maligned by those who hate the whatever. The phrase is dead. And, and not all the programs were great. And yes, there was some gaming and all that stuff. There is no perfect. There's bums in my family. I don't need to go look for bums in the DE and I program. I got bums in my family. I believe in the bum factor, Joe. 20% of Republicans <laughs> are bums. 20% of Democrats are bums. I think every family's got them, John. I look at my family. I'm like, yeah, there's those people that are all in our closet, right? So there's a bum factors everywhere. Okay, but fine. Let's assume you kill DE and I. You, you do all this stuff. Where's the farm club coming, given the demographics I just gave you, that allow those who killed those programs to continue to live a life of wealth and comfort? According to Citigroup, discrimination against Blacks alone between the year 2000 and the year 220 Citigroup now, not the NAACP, reported that it cost the U.S. economy, discrimination against blacks alone, for 20 years alone, cost the U.S. economy $16 trillion. Trillion. Don't believe me. Go to the report. Go to the Business Plan for America website. Read the report yourself. And if we just knock it off, Joe, we just stop doing it, not because we're moral, although I hope you're moral, but because you want self-interest. You want to keep your party going of economic prosperity. You pick up a trillion dollars a year. Now, we have a $26, $27 trillion economy. That's not inconsequential. A trillion dollars against $26, $27 trillion is real money. I think there's 2 to 3% of GDP locked in the bottom of the pyramid of poor whites, largest population of poverty in this country, blacks, browns, others, women, but also middle class folks who feel that the ladder for them is broken, that no one is trying to help them go from the bottom to the top which is why you have so many people saying they hate rich people, which is not true. You hate rich people until you become rich. What you hate is a game system. What you hate is a system that you think is rigged against you so that you, no matter how hard you work, you can't succeed. What you hate and you resent is somebody telling you to bootstrap yourself when somebody stole your shoes and denied you shoelaces because two generations ago, it was illegal for you to learn to read and write. I'm, I, I, I'd laugh at some of this stuff because... It's like right in your face. Like my grandfather was a sharecropper born in 1871. My grandfather, which is my great-grandfather, was a slave without question. My second great-grandfather fought in the Union Army in response to the Emancipation Proclamation and as a slave fought to protect those enslaving him in Memphis, Tennessee, as one of 7,000 officers fighting in the U.S. colored troops. I'm not emotional about this. Uh, I like math because it doesn't have an opinion. I know that people live through fear sometimes. And that's what's going on now is they want a promise of the past. (laughs) Can somebody please deliver me the past? The future scares me. The present terrifies me, but the future really scares me. Deliver for me a return to the past. That is a lie. It's not happening. It's not coming back. And it wasn't all that great, by the way, when you were in it. (laughs) This mythology of the past that none of us actually experienced. But you, you even say that even if we take this math down to just financial stupidity, which generally, you know, I guess the word stupidity is, is not the right word. The fact that we don't have financial literacy cost us hundreds of billions of dollars. $350 billion is a conservative estimate of what financial illiteracy costs the U.S. economy every year. $350 billion is the conservative estimate. If you think about, uh, we have mapped every zip code in America by credit score, Operation Hope has, and there's a Hope Financial Wellness Index people can go to. You want to tell me your zip code, I'll tell you your credit score, I'll tell you how you're living. And you go to a white, rural, poor neighborhood, like where my wife grew up in West Virginia, or you go to a black, brown, urban neighborhood, like where I grew up, you'll often see the same thing, Joe. You see a check casher next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent on store, and a title lender, as in the title of your car, that you've loan, you've given them the title of your car for a short-term loan, payday loans, rent-to-own stores, pawn shops, liquor stores, and a church down the street, that's just your neighborhood psychologist trying to make sure you don't go crazy once a week and you don't go postal on Monday. That's your neighborhood therapist. Now, black and brown folks, we go to church differently. Black folks are very loud, we're emotional, we're passionate. My white folks, we're a bit more structured, a bit more more, a bit more left brain, we're a bit more right brain, but we're both going to church because we're trying to, to not go postal on Monday. We're trying to not go crazy in this world of ours. 
and black folks, again, we riot loudly. I mean, Dr. King said that violence was the, the voice of the unseen and unheard. But my poor white friends appear to be rioting at the ballot box right now. Hello. So they're frustrated because the business plan for America walked away from them in 1970 after the Industrial Revolution was coming to an end, and no one gave them a new business plan. No one gave them a software upgrade. And they've sat around resentful for 50 plus years, and they are right to be frustrated and upset. They have every right. By the way, 25% of my clients are poor whites in the Deep South through Hope Inside programs that we have with banks like Bank First Tennessee and others. So I serve all of God's children. And I found what I've just told you to be true. All of the problems are the, are the same. And if I can get the credit score up 50 points to 100 points, which is what we're doing at Operation Hope, get the debt down $3,800 for somebody making $48,000 a year, get the savings up $2,000, the bank can say yes to the home ownership loan or the line of credit or the small business loan they want to create. The bank, if you can get the credit score up to 700, my God, 750, the computer just starts saying yes to you. And all of a sudden you don't feel resentful of other people or the world around you as much. And so this affects everybody. And it absolutely affects your listeners and their, their way of life. Let me be blunt. We take America for granted. Everybody wants to be an American but Americans. We're entitled and spoiled. The city of Los Angeles, as an example, where I grew up as a young man, has give or take 6 million residents and 10,000 police officers, give or take, with a sidearm, cufflinks, and one round backup clip. That's not safety, Joe. That's hope. <laughs> because if anything goes sideways, and it did after the Rodney King riots where I founded Operation Hope, the then chief of police told his officers to get out of South Central LA. He told them to abandon. He thought, go, they were, go get out of there. You're going to be overrun. And I thought it was a punk move, by the way. But he was doing a mathematical analysis that here's all these people coming at you, and he only had X number of officers and so my point is that the city of L.A., which is one of the largest economies in the world, only works, Joe, if people believe, if I play by the rules, I keep my nose clean, I do the right thing, I obey the law, I work hard, I'm respectful of my elders, I stop at red lights. It'll pay off in a reasonable shot of success and failure on my own merit. And that hope thing, that if I can go from the bottom to the top, that I'm going to add to GDP, I'm going to make all these companies that your investors listening to this are investing in, the companies that make televisions, the companies that make appliances, the companies that make and lease and finance cars, you know, the companies that make the materials that go into a house, the companies that own the restaurants, the companies that own the technology, the backbone and the front loaded like Apple and Samsung, et cetera. You're investing in these companies. You're investing in Walmart, great company. You're investing in Target. We call it Target in our neighborhood. You're investing in McDonald's, McDonald's, right? You're investing in these stocks. Well, that can only works if people at the bottom who are driving the economy are healthy enough to actually continue to partake and trade up on their car and renew their lease and buy a new refrigerator every five or seven years or whenever they do it. So you have all of you and a self-interest. There's no investment stock called the police. There's no investment stock called the U.S. Army. There's no investment stock called war bonds that you benefit from. We don't, in America, I mean. So you need to invest in peace and serenity. And peace and serenity is prosperity for all. So, yes. Well, and how we get there, John, you write, is through education. And I want to talk about some of the different people that we need to educate but you start off by by really going after credit and the way that we use credit. You've got a whole chapter called Credit is a Tool, Not a Toy. Let's talk about how we're misusing credit in America. Well, you first of all, people think credit is money. <laughs> start there. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I had to learn that the hard way, by the way. I think a lot of us did, that I had to learn through the 90s that, you know what, this is not money. Me too, by the way. Look, the most dangerous thing in my wallet today, Joe, I'm pulling my wallet out, literally is my American Express black card. Right. <laughs> because this thing here, and it's sexy, and it looks nice, and it's pretty. Or, oh, yeah, and it's heavy. It's heavy. It's, you know, it's got a little chip in it in case you want to kidnap me. <laughs> it, it, there's no limit on it. And it's like, oh, oh, I can, that means I can go buy the car in the car dealership, and technically I can buy the car dealership. 
but that's not even a credit card. This is a charge card, which means in 30 days, I got to pay this payment. I got to pay the whole balance. A lot of people get in trouble. You start seeing celebrities in their bankruptcies and people who've won the lottery or whatever. You see this credit card stuff because they thought this was an extension of their wallet. And, and literally, it's just simply a way you, you're supposed to park a charge until such time as you can now or in a reasonable amount of time pay it back is not meant to be an extension on your annual compensation. But when you got too much month at the end of your money and you got low levels of financial literacy and high level and low levels of self-esteem and high levels of ego and insecurity, you start wearing your assets on your ass. <laughs> and so that's the easy sort of upscale example of this. But the, what most people are dealing with in their life is they confuse good debt with bad debt, whether there's a credit card or whether it's a regular loan. Capital can be equity in debt, by the way. I'm not sure people know that. But the good debt, whether it be a credit card, consumer debt, or whether it's another vehicle of capital provision, good debt is tied to something that appreciates. And bad debt is tied to something that depreciates. So if you're financing jewelry or financing clothes at a department store at 28% interest on that credit card, you're financing bad debt. If you're financing a concert ticket, financing, and people do this, they finance concert tickets, they finance car rentals, they finance vacations at 26% interest. That's bad debt. And, you, and the party's over instantaneously and you're paying on it for years. I give an example of a credit card used to buy a, a car. $14,000. And in that example, if you make the minimum payment 10 years later, you will have paid double for that car and not a, a penny of principal. And this, and so Ambassador Andrew Young has said to live in a system of free enterprise, he's on the, the balcony when Dr. King was assassinated in, in 1968. He's my dear friend and mentor. To live in a system of free enterprise and not to understand the rules of free enterprise must be the very definition of slavery. So you, you have over a trillion dollars of credit card debt almost three and a half now. Um, you said average person's carrying over $6,000 of credit card debt. Right. And it becomes a noose around your neck because it doesn't go away. You can't shake it off. You can't say, oh, I was just kidding. It's easy to get it and hard to get rid of it. And that is the biggest move of your credit score, by the way, is your consumer credit card debt. I use credit cards coming up, but I use them for a business or businesses that I was trying to start when I didn't have traditional capital. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people out there saying, John should not advocate using credit cards to uh, start a business. Well, yeah, we shouldn't have poverty in America either. And that we shouldn't have had slavery and we shouldn't have had, had there's a whole bunch of things we shouldn't have today. We shouldn't have racism. We have all kinds of things we shouldn't have. But when you don't have a lot of optionality, you're going to have to get creative. And I used one credit card for my auto to get repaired at Pet Boys. And I only used it in an emergency. I only used it when I had to repair that tire or replace that tire, which, by the way, put me on the road to making some money on contracts. So that, to me, that was good debt. I'll, I'll admit it. Early on in my career, I used to use my credit card to buy stocks. I'm sure that people are going to go crazy now. This guy talked about that the interest rates on the credit card outweigh the return on the stock on an annualized basis. That's true. But culture is not only the most important thing in business, it's the only thing in business and life and going public on Wall Street is storytelling. So what story are you telling yourself? What is the culture in your household? What is the culture and story in your head? And the, the, the story I was telling was, I'm an investor, not a consumer. I'm investing in myself. I'm investing in American stock. Because once I buy a, a, one stock, I got all the financials from that company. So it was a very cheap bet for me to buy a stock uh, share of stock or fractional share. I get all this data and information that made me smarter. You're buying education. I bought an education, but I also bought aspiration because now I'm an investor and I have an investor mindset. And Joe, that gave me more energy. Mm. And it gave me more optimism. It made me a believer in the American dream. And that, my friend, was priceless. Confidence leads to competence, which gives you the, the desire to take the next step. And it's this wild cycle. You are one of the, if not the premier person who is uh, educating so many entrepreneurs in America. I don't know any organization that's, that's uh, educating as many people as you guys are at Operation Hope. Chicken or the egg, John? I mean, which one is it? Does this education start at home? Should we, our stackers out there, is it, is it time we're not spending with our family, with our kids and digging into podcasts like this one? Or 
or reading your awesome book, or is it a more of a systemic, this should start at school? Is it our schools? Is it our home life? Like, where's the, where does this meter begin? I love your questions. You're always so smart. And you ask me questions that are not boring. They're real hard ones. I hate boring questions. I love tough ones. So it's a two-part answer. If you're a privileged class, which are most people probably that are stackers and listening to this, then your problem is first generation made it, second generation is going to spend it, third generation is going to lose it. Because you've made it, I've seen so many of my wealthy friends who don't want their children to suffer and sacrifice. What the hell are you talking about? You can't grow through it unless, unless you grow through legitimate suffering. Rainbows only follow storms. You're good at what you do because you struggled, you hustled, you worked hard. An entrepreneur works 18 hours a day to keep from getting a job. What is this participation medal crap? Like, you know, there are winners and losers in life. I don't mind you giving somebody a medal for participation, but don't say that's just as good as coming in first, second, or third. Because when you're trying to get market share for your business, third is very different than first. Second is very different from first. I mean, Blockbuster was second. They're also bankrupt to Netflix, and they could have bought Netflix for $50 million, but they were arrogant, and they were presumptuous, and they're out of business. Sears could have been Amazon, right? They could have been. They had a a layaway book, and you you could mail order catalogs 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but lazy, arrogant, presumptuous, and just decided, you know what? This success is on remote control, but success only comes before work in one place, and that's the dictionary, because it's alphabetical. So the wealthy people need to sort of, low self-esteem is everywhere. So if you're low self-esteem and high confidence, that can become arrogance. And you Mm -hmm. see it in your political leaders right now. Low self-esteem, insecurity, arrogance, overconfidence, money, and wealth. Extraordinarily dangerous. Now, if you're a parent who has that mindset, you're trying to floss for your kids. You're trying to floss for your wife. You may be living beyond your means, but what you're not doing is requiring your children to go to work with you. You're not, you're not doing is requiring your child to be the caddy at the golf place, which is where you learn how to build relationship capital. You're not giving them, you're robbing them of the hustle they're going to need when they get from underneath your coverage. Now we can do a whole podcast on entitlement and how that's a death nail for resiliency and success. I was homeless. I grew up in the hood priceless. I dare anybody to come into a negotiating room with me. Come on. Come on. You got more degrees. You got credentials. You got PhD. Come on. Let's set an appointment. I'll run circles around you because I get up earlier. I hustle harder. I work later because I know I don't have those credentials. I grew up in the hood. I know. So I've had to overcompensate that insecurity tied to self-esteem tied to an understanding that nobody's going to give me anything and I can lose anything at any moment. The paranoia keeps me on my game. That should be passed down to your children. It's a culture. Now, flip it. My poor friends, you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. So it's what they don't know that they don't know that's killing them, but they think they know. Why do they want to be rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers? All you see in your neighborhood growing up as symbols of success are rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers. It's rational. You're modeling what you see. And all a drug dealer is is an illegal, unethical entrepreneur. You understand import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer service, security, territory, logistics. I mean, NASCAR came from moonshine running. This is everywhere. (laughs) This is not just poor (laughs) black people, right? So you have brilliance everywhere. Some of it gets, it's easier to, to mine. So you have this brilliance in the stackers that gets thrown away in second and third generation because the right DNA was not emphasized. The right culture was not emphasized. So you've gone from a maker to a spender. (laughs) You made it. Your family's going to spend it. See how long that lasts. Now you got people in the hood who can hustle, but confuse making money with building wealth. And you build wealth in your sleep. 18% of black people own stocks. 41% of us, 42%, 43% own a home. We're not making, we don't own, we don't have life insurance policies. We don't have wills. We're hustlers. We we over-index on, I want to get that bag. I want to make that money. I want to get this dollar. I want to get this cash. I mean, that all money is, is all currency is an exchange of value. It's nothing. It means nothing. It's literally making a living. Money today is making a living today, not building a life. So Steve Jobs, a Jordanian immigrant, people don't know that. His dad was Jordanian. His mother was Caucasian. They fell in love with each other, and she was having his baby. 
And daddy of the lady said, oh, no, 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 no. You're not having this baby. Uh, not in this household. We're going to put this baby up for adoption. So they did. And the requirement was had to be an ultra wealthy family, highly educated. That first family, Joe, accepted and then rejected Steve. They rejected him at the last minute, so they had to find a new family to adopt him. So they scramble, and now they find this middle-class family in Silicon Valley, names the Jobs family. And by the luck of a zip code, not the brilliance or the entitlement of a superior race, <laughs> the luck of a zip code, Steve, who looked white, was actually white and Jordanian, Middle Eastern, <laughs> who saved the world, right away. He happens to live in Silicon Valley in this middle-class family. And who's around the corner? This guy named Wozniak. And they go in their garage and create a company that you and I love today called Apple. I've got my phone right here. I got mine right here somewhere too. Yeah. They pioneered the touchscreen and all this stuff. Before this was a Blackberry. And everything was, it was, it was, you know, you touched it, you moved it, keys and all that kind of stuff. They changed the whole dang on world. But what if Steve Jobs was not in, uh, didn't get lucky? And adopted there. What if he's adopted by a single mother on the south side, deep in the south side of Chicago, where drug dealers were all around him? And mom was at work, working two jobs. There was no father at home. He'd be the biggest, baddest drug dealer the world has ever seen. <laughs> because your talent's going to go somewhere. So in both situations, it's culture, to answer your question. Yeah. And, and it's intentional. Success is intentional. My wife, Shacha, would say all behavior is learned behavior. So when you go home tonight, let your children know you're reading the Wall Street Journal. Let your children listen to the fact that you're listening to this wonderful podcast with Joe. Listen to this one and listen to others. Talk about what you just experienced. Read the book, Financial Literacy for All. Have your kids have input on the review that I want you to make on Amazon on the book or wherever you happen to get the book, Walmart or Black bookstore, wherever you happen to get your book, put a, put a review up. Have your child co contribute to that. Have a weekly meeting about money. Let them know that the lights don't come on by themselves. You know, I thought it was funny, John. And by the way, not funny. I thought it was incredible. Encouraging people with their kids not to be cool. Don't try to be cool. Try to be, and I like this quote, intellectually dangerous. You had, you had somebody tell you that as you were growing up. And I thought that was the most badass phrase. Intellectually dangerous is something, man. I. Every kid should aspire to be intellectually dangerous. Forget cool. Yeah, that's Tim Burt, who I just saw an hour and a half ago. And we did a kickoff of the American Aspiration Tour. So good. With Mayor Andre Dickens here in Atlanta. I'm in conversation with mayors across the city, across the country on this American Aspiration Tour. So this today was kickoff. And Tim said, who's a contractor, he owns a business here, a good man. He said, you know, I've decided that there's a decision that everybody needs to make. You're going to decide whether you want to be famous or dangerous. <laughs> and he said, I decided I want to be dangerous, mentally, intellectually <laughs> dangerous. One is from the shoulders down and won't last but a minute. The other one is the neck up and will last for a lifetime. Once you get educated, you'll never be uneducated. No one can take your education from you. You combine that with financial freedom, which nobody can take from you unless you screw it up. And you are, you bad. I mean, financial freedom, Joe, just might be the only freedom that no one can take from you. When you know better, you do better. And we should want everybody to be financially literate. There is no downside to this conversation. And nobody wakes up in the morning and says, let me be a bum. Let me be a crook. Let me be a, a scourge to society. They wake up in the morning on survival mode and maybe angry at society. And then they want to go take what's not theirs. I'm not rationalizing. I'm explaining it. You want people to have more than they need for themselves. So they leave you alone. <laughs> right? I mean... <laughs> I, you can, I can talk about this more. <laughs> at the very least. At the very least. At the very least. Yeah. I just wish you were passionate about this, John. If you were at all passionate <laughs> about this, it would be it'd be better. The book is Financial Literacy for All, Disrupting Struggle, Advancing Financial Freedom, Building a New American Middle Class. You have some great, um, and I'll encourage everybody to read at the, a, at the beginning how it's broken and why the system's broken. And then the education piece that we had a little conversation about, you've lots of conversation about this, but also some models, a model in Singapore, what Delta Airlines have done, some pretty powerful things that companies have done and countries have done to make the system better. It's, it's powerful stuff. And, and banks, Joe, banks, and banks. getting the banks out of the no business. Sorry, you declined for credit. 
and back into the yes business. You've been approved because your credit score went up, your debt went down, your savings went up because of our coaching at Operation Hope. Have you ever seen, there was a piece that I quote quite a bit a few years ago by a group called uh, Nonfiction Research, which goes through a lot of the statistics that you go through, John, about the number of people that have eaten out of a dumpster before, the number of people that have unfortunately had to trade sex for money, the number of people, just these horrible statistics. Wow. At the end of this powerful piece, they kind of lay the blame at banks, that banks do a lot of transactional business and not enough business in education which is something, frankly, they could even probably charge for. Yeah. And that could be a huge revenue stream for them. And it creates a customer base that's wealthier as a result. Kind of what you're seeing with Delta Airlines employees. Yes. yes. Well, the Delta model is a great model. Their CEO, Ed Bastion, is promoting what I call stakeholder capitalism. He's on my board. It's the wealthiest airline in the world, most profitable airline in the world, biggest airline in the world. Even when they screwed up, it wasn't their screw up. It was a part of Microsoft and some tech era. But they were slow to correct. They even, I was over there yesterday doing a town hall meeting. They acknowledged it. They're like, yeah, we, we blew it. We didn't recover as quickly as we could. Most of our leaders here have only been here for three years. We should have gone and gotten some wisdom. Some people who were, worked here for 30, you know, who used to use pen and paper <laughs> before technology. <laughs> but I mean, leadership is not just doing the right thing. It's also life is 10% what life does to you and 90% how you respond to it. And responding with authenticity builds trust. And banking is a trust business. So anyway, the, the Delta model is a great model. Financial coaching and counseling at the bottom. Uh, $1,000 emergency savings account for anybody at Delta who goes through our coaching program. Ours, our Fidelity Investments program. And then they do profit sharing at the top. As the company does well, their employees do well. And again, most profitable airline in the world. And even when they screw up, they screw up in a way that's admirable and inspirational. The banks, I think, yes, need to renew their business model and upgrade their software. AI is going to drag them into the future, I think, artificial intelligence. I thought about charging for financial education, but that actually is very smart to think about that. They need to rethink everything. Are banks responsible for this? It's hard to say that banks are not holding some responsibility because banking is arguably one of the oldest businesses in the world. It's always been with us. And clearly, you can't finance anything. Uh, you can't grow an economy without accessing bank capital. Banks in the 1800s actually underwrote and secured slaves, human beings, as collateral for loans for plantations. That's a little known fact. J.P. Morgan Chase had human beings in their asset list. Truist Bank and a bunch of other, any bank that's over 150 years old, give or take, probably had some interesting engagement with the wealth creators of that time which were slaveholders. So you don't have to go very far back to lay some blame in the banking sector. But I do commend them also because they're the only federally backed private institution in America. And they've done a good job of honoring that through the Community Reinvestment Act, where half a billion, half a trillion dollars gets reinvested back into underserved neighborhoods. No other business model does that in America. No, no, no one. Half a trillion dollars, Joe, gets reinvested through the Community Reinvestment Act so if you're getting all your deposits from the north of your city, you've got to make some effort to reinvest investment, lending, and service in the south of your city on a safe and sound basis, which means you got to provide financial literacy education for those residents so that you're making a loan that does get paid back. They're not charging for it, but they're paying for it. They're paying organizations like ours to do financial literacy education. But I'm trying to get these companies and banks to mainstream this as a business model, not a philanthropy model. Not yeah, a right. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's very congruent with what they're saying. Use it as a business model, not, you know, look at us giving back. Right. Again, the book is Financial Literacy for All. We will link to uh, Operation Hope. We'll link to the book on our show notes at Stecky Benjamins. I just got to say again there, Mr. Brian, thank you, not just for mentoring our stackers today, but for mentoring so many people across the United States and beyond. I so, as you know, so appreciate your work. Well, I appreciate you. And my, the answer is always yes. When I see your name comes across my desk, I'll be honored to talk to you always. You're good people. I want for your listeners to know there are good guys and ladies on Wall Street. We're trying to get folks from the streets to the C-suites. And, you know, Truist Bank, their CEO, Bill Rogers, we're almost half of all branches. Uh, there are 2,000 branches, we're 800, because they're trying to get folks from being in the no category to the yes category. They realize it's an emerging market for them. Wells Fargo has ordered 100 Hope Inside locations. I deal directly with Charlie Scharf, their CEO. They're taking it seriously. Brian Moynihan, Bank of America. I deal directly with their C-suite. They're ordered 100 locations. U.S. Bank, Sonovis Bank, 
Regions Bank, First Horizon Bank, Banco Popular in Latin America and Puerto Rico. So most every bank in this country, if your listeners know of a credible bank that they're proud of, J.B. Morgan Chase is a partner. I, I was going to see Jamie Dimon last week. We had rescheduled. They're supporters in some way of our work. And that's reason to be proud. And uh, my goal is to be in 10% of all banks in America in the next two to three years. So I'm working hard at that. And then going into the workplace with Hope Inside the Workplace, our partners with UPS, Delta, and by the way, KKR on Wall Street, Apollo, they're hiring us to work with their subsidiaries. There's a lot of good folks. Aries Management, Tony Rester, Michael Arigetti, there's a lot of good people trying to do the right thing. Well, I hope we can add to that number, John. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and you have no idea how excited everyone is that John Hope Bryant just spoke. I even wore my best bow tie and jorts for that. And wow, mission accomplished, John. Well, I think after that, it's time for Joe and OG to get going on financial literacy, and don't you? So let's get you some trivia to prime the pump, as Joe's mom says when she reaches for the beef eater gin just before cranking out the Boone's farm. It's like her pregame. While there's lots of room for better financial education in the USA, things are actually looking up. In the last 10 years, we've gone from nearly zero financial education courses in America to 17% of students receiving some financial education last year. And that's going up to 26% this coming year. So here's the question. What percentage of students do experts expect to have some guaranteed financial education in America in 2030? Is it 81%? 53% or 41%. I'll be back with your answer right after I figure out how to make this bow tie stay on my members only jacket. Hey there stackers, I'm 80s chick magnet and the guy OG calls our basement's own financial disruptor, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I can hear OG waiting in the wings, so let's get you your trivia answer. The question was, how many USA students are expected to receive financial literacy education in schools by the year 2030? Was it 41%, 53%, or 81%? The answer, according to experts, just over half, or 53% of our nation's youths, will receive some financial literacy training by 2030. You know, it's not as, not as big as we'd like to see, that's what she said, or hope. But as Joe's mom says, it's about improvement, not perfection. Speaking of hope, here come two guys helping John Hope bring you hope for your financial future, Joe and OG. What, you couldn't hold back, could you? No. It's just, you saw the opportunity for the, that's what she said, yeah. and just had to. It's automatic. It's like when, you, when you're at the doctor's office and they whack your knee with that little hammer and your foot kicks out. It just happens. Isn't it funny how you just, you, you just, and even as you're saying it, you're like, yeah, that's kind of annoying, <laughs> but, but I got to do it. It's expected now. I mean, got to, got to go. Yeah. Oh, gee, I don't think that it's uh, lost on any of us that what we heard from John Hope Bryant, that one of the reasons why we have so much more financial literacy in schools, probably a little bit due to him, his work with companies like Delta, Walmart. I mean, some of the biggest names in America. Let's get on to our headline. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. We have a big headline today, OG. This comes to us from Investment News, but heck, if you have a pulse, you know what happened in the financial markets early last week. This piece is written by- Big bag of nothing. Chris Davis, don't shy away from whipsawing markets. I kind of like the name whipsaw, whipsaw. Uh, okay. <laughs> wow. He really does have the Mondays. In this piece, uh, for those people that don't know, last Monday we had a market that uh, went downtown. downtown. R remember old MTV, Downtown Julie Brown? This market went Downtown Julie Brown. I don't know if that's a thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the market went way down. And uh, then what happened, OG? Uh, nothing. Nothing really happened. My favorite part of last week's articles were on Friday after the close when it just said, Markets finish exactly where they started for the week. <laughs> like, so basically nothing happened. I know huh, weird. we spent a lot of time lately talking about not buying in volatile markets. So I, I didn't want this to be a thing, but this was the headline last week, all week long. 
This why, this why, w- why wouldn't you buy in volatile markets? Right. This was it. Excuse me, not last week. This is two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, 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 was was Sorry. big yeah, and. Right and and we have made this point though, OG, over and over and over. But with John Hope Bryant just here, there's still people. You know, one of his books was called The Memo. Still, people haven't gotten the memo. Hmm. Advisors all over the place. This one will start off with this gentleman, Jeff Housinger, President and CEO at All Seasons Wealth. He says he faces it head on. Quote with his clients: Make sure they're not in a position where they need to take out. When the market happens to be down, he explains, stressing the importance of asset allocation and liquidity. Boy, OG, that sounds familiar. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, and that's really the biggest risk when market fluctuation happens, whether it's a short term, week long blip. Hey, it could be that last two Mondays ago was the high water mark for the year. We don't we won't know that until the end of the year. Right. Like until it happens, we don't know that it happened. That's one of the weird things about the stock market. But um, but if you if you know that you're going to need some cash, I was talking to somebody a little bit ago and there they said, well, you know, I, I, I think I need this money in about 18 months, but I should just go ahead and invest it. Right. It's like, well, no, you have 18 months. That should be sitting in I had somebody say that to me last week. It actually was was my spouse. OK. Yeah. Well, I wasn't talking to Cheryl, but but I mean, you know, no, I'm we saying just, I had the same thing. We've got this goal yeah. 18 months out. And she's like, is there something better that we could do than Ally? We keep our emergency fund at Ally and our short-term money Ally. She's like, it just seems like we could probably invest that money and maybe make 10 or 15%. Yeah. No. Where on the gambling spectrum would you like to put it? I mean, we could make 500% if we hit a streaker in Vegas. You know, I mean, where, where do you want to put this? And that's really what you're trying to do with having a solid cash reserve. If you're closing in on retirement or you know that you've got an expense coming up, that money needs to be liquid. It, you You don't get to gamble with that anymore and recognize that if you said, or if Cheryl said, listen, I don't care. I want to invest the money. I'm okay with what happens. Then yeah, you are gambling, right? You're saying I'm willing to trade the predictability of this asset being there when I need it for the chance that it was, is more or less than what I need when I need it. Right. I'm willing to trade the time, the time, the, the 18 months in your example, I'm trying to, I'm willing to trade that away for an opportunity to make more money because if you don't have the money, if it's like a house down payment or it's the final payment on your vacation plan. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, what well, we, we needed 30 grand. We only have 22. Guess what? You don't get to do your time frame for buying a house. Isn't 18 months. It's now 36 months. Cause you have 22. You have to get back to 30. You know what I mean? That yeah, that's what you're trading. You're saying I'm trading away the security of the time frame against the fluctuation or potential that maybe it's worth more. I should tell you actually what happened there because people that know my spouse know that she's smart enough to know better than that. She uh, she wanted to raise the question with the market being down, OG, what if we took it and we invested it? And and hey, with the market being down like this, our probability that it might be higher 18 months from now is better. What if we took the chance? I'm like, we, we got construction dudes that we're talking to right now and we're, we're starting to develop this plan. And she's like, well, what if we just push that off? Because it's a great time for the market. It was cool that we were able to have that conversation, which I think is the opposite conversation that a lot of people have. Because in this piece, they say, what about the economic uncertainty? This is all based on, and you saw this in the headlines over and over, this is all based on economic uncertainty. This gentleman, again- So show me a period of time when there is economic certainty. Jeff Hausinger says exactly that, OG. Quote, I try to remember we always have economic uncertainty, he notes. And the biggest risk, you know, OG, is when we're certain there is no uncertainty. Like that's the time of biggest risk historically is Probably, when you're high-fiving yeah. yourself and you're like, things are going great. Look at how great My I am. God, we're all geniuses. Yeah. I mean, in most investors' memory right now, most people who are investing can remember the two greatest calamities that have happened in the last hundred years in our country and in the world the great financial recession in 2007, 2008, 2009, where basically banks stopped working. I mean, it took quite literally an act of Congress to get banks to keep working, right? I mean, they were failing. And and if you weren't like of age during that time, I don't know that you can really put yourself in those shoes and, and recognize how, how it felt to be in the situation where like literally the bank said, we don't have it right now. You could try again later, maybe. I mean, it was complete chaos. 
and the S and P closed at six sixty six, kind of ominous. But it closed at six sixty six in March of two thousand nine. Then about ten or twelve years later, we have this huge event that kills off millions of people across the world. And for the longest period of time, I mean, even the most ardent, like, it'll be fine, right? Bro, it's cool. It's just a cold. I mean, even the most ardent people were like, I don't know, man. (laughs) I mean, Alice was pretty healthy and she's gone. You know what I mean? Like that stuff was happening. And the market went down 35% in 17 trading days. Those two things haven't happened in a hundred years in the world. And yet over that period of time, the stock market went up. Your investment portfolio went up during that time. Wow. Hey, OG, this is a legit question. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Different than all I just the like, others. you're like, wow. When he's got to preface it with, this is a legit question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Because you just assume everything coming out of my mouth is hilarity. No, you said in the last hundred years, and I am I'm genuinely curious to know, were both of those events worse than 1929 and 1987? 1987? What happened in 87? Black Monday? Big jackknife down. That was like a day. It's like literally one day. Literally came right back. Okay. So I guess yeah, 1987. I'm, I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm just I'm genuinely curious. During the depression, of course not. The depression was you know a 10 year problem. Black Monday. That's why the circuit breakers are in place now in the stock market to kind of prevent that from happening. But yeah, it went down and went back up shortly thereafter. So yeah, if you got caught with your, as Buffett would say, swimming naked when the tide went out, <laughs> you know you were pretty exposed uh, on that day. So no, there hasn't been a minus 20 in one day. But minus 35 and 17 days, I bet feels a lot like minus 20 in one day. Yeah. I wasn't investing in 1987. So I don't have any perspective on that. So I'm sure there's people out there that can remember it. But the long term 55% market decline during the recession in 2007, 2009, the global pandemic of unknown situation. And I'm not talking about the actual economic impact. I'm talking about the fact that it was purely completely unknown. I mean, for a long period of time, what was going to happen? You know, I mean, you'd wander outside and go for a walk and somebody would be a block away and they'd cross the street because you're like, I don't, I don't know. It's maybe, maybe I shouldn't be within a block of a person. I don't know the rules yet. You know what I mean? Like it was, why isn't her dog wearing a mask? It would. I mean, it can, we got it squared away. It took some time, but my point all in all of this is, is whatever you think the economic issues are today can't possibly be worse than they were in 2007. And even if they're like, oh, it's just like 07. All right. I got that. We got through that. Okay. I mean, we got through COVID. Okay. Money wise, given it enough time. So I can't see how somebody would have that in their mind and that experience and then go, but what if this person wins or this person doesn't win? Or what happens if oil prices go high or low? It's like, Individual positions, individual stock positions, if you own individual stocks, there's some chance that you get wiped out every day. All of a sudden, this company ceases to exist for whatever reason. But if you're diversified, that's the purpose of of diversification. You're never going to get completely wiped out. I think it's a good reminder. It's a great reminder. Uh, And I know we've talked about this a lot lately, Stackers, but apparently we need to because there's lots of people out there that, that sold into this. You know, everybody's... I mean, I had a conversation with a guy last week that... On Monday, sold his portfolio. Oh, beginning to the end, sell it out to cash. I'm like, dude, if you'd have just been on vacation for a week. And he didn't sell on Monday, by the way, the morning. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sold Monday at the night. So he got all the decline on Monday, never got any of the recovery Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it might be worth it to explain to people why that is. If you own mutual funds, mutual funds work like a subway where there's exit stops at the end of every day. You're on the subway for the day, no matter what time you sell. So if you decide to sell at noon and you have mutual funds, you don't sell until the end of the trading session, four o'clock in the afternoon, the doors open at four o'clock, people get on, people get off, they close again, then you're on for the next day. So even if you think, Oh gee, that you're going to be smart and catch it on the way down at 10 AM, you got mutual. It sounds like that's what this guy had must've been mutual funds. He just, he just waited till the end of the day. He just saw the news at the end of the day and went, oh, it's yeah. going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And it didn't. And the reality is, is that that may prove to be correct. You know what I mean? Like in the short run. In the short run, 
again, like I said, a couple Mondays ago could be the high water mark for the year. It could be the high water mark for the next three years. We could have just a long term, you know, minus 10, minus 10, minus 10, like 2000, 2001, half of 2002 and three. And it's like, you don't know that until you're in it. But still, the problem with trying to time on the way down is you have to be right on the way back. And it's just it's just not possible. I don't know anyone and I don't care who they say they are. I don't know anyone who on March 22nd of 2020 was like, oh, market down 11% today, down 34% 17 Bingo. days. Bingo. Let's get it. Let's get it. No, you, di- you didn't do that. Unless you were normally dollar cost averaging in, you did not freaking do it. And if you did, send me a send me the trade slip that shows that you got a home equity line and you put 500 grand in the market. You know, you sold on March 1st and you bought back in on freaking March 22nd. All your money. Not like I dabbled and I sold 10%. None of that stuff. I just don't think it happens. I don't have any proof that somebody's done that successfully. And I, and I never saw anybody in March of 2009, the market's down 55%, go, you know what, today would be great. <laughs> I got an idea. <laughs> this is exactly what excites me about indexing, is that for the average person out there, Indexing is so cool during this time frame because in, in these markets, like a couple Mondays ago, OG, what do we see? The market's pretty damn indiscriminate when prices fall. Horrible companies' prices fall, which is deserved, right? I mean, if a company sucks, then over time, that company stock is going to go down. The, the company will go bye-bye. To your point, yep. if you own an individual position, there's a chance every day that you're going to lose your ass. You, you could lose it all. But if the company's really well run, that's probably not going to happen. If it's mediocre run, better chance, but still probably not going to happen. But if it's a crappy company, yeah, company could go bankrupt. But on a day like two Mondays ago, horrible companies, mediocre companies, and great companies all went down and almost all because people were just selling the market by almost the same percentages. Now, some went down a little more and some went down a little less, but on a broad basis, it sank everybody. And the cool thing about owning an index is all you have to do is believe the economy is going to continue. It's all you got to do. And the horrible companies, if a company OG sucks bad enough, I think a lot of people don't realize this, you don't have to sell it. It'll leave the S&P 500. Let's say that's what you're buying, the 500 biggest companies in America, big, strong companies. And if it's bad enough that it's no longer one of those 500, the index cleans it for you. It's like a self-cleaning oven. It's a self-cleaning portfolio. So you're like, oh, my God, well, look at this. Stocks suck. Well, you know, if they really, really, really suck, the S&P 500 will sell it for you. And guess what you can do? Nothing. You can do nothing, and the crap will exit your portfolio on these horrible days. But you'll hang on to all of the good stuff if you just do nothing. Love indexing for that reason. You know, this is a great conversation, Joe. And I've been working on a, a contest, a giveaway of sorts. Uh, man, I'll give away. It's a Ooh. contest. This is straight up a race. We're going to launch it next week. I can't wait to share it with you because I texted it to you last night and I was like, dude, I have the greatest contest ever because I'm a money nerd. And uh, this, happens, put- this happens as Doug knows about once every, I'd say, uh, five years, 11 months. I have an idea. I'm like, I have an idea. <laughs> Stop the presses. So it's happened two and a half times. This is my third great idea. We've been on the air. <laughs> Actually, I take that back. You know, the last time that he had an idea like this, he called me one day. He's like, it's been right in front of us the whole time. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, what? He oh, goes, yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't yeah. we call this segment better call Saul? <laughs> like, yeah. what? Why would we call yeah. it that? And yeah, my kids have been talking about that show for 100 years. Anyways, I can't wait to have stackers enter this. We got to figure out what kind of prizes you win and the mechanics behind the scenes of uh, of entries. But suffice it to say, it'll be a fun little gambit of a quiz. You get to partake. A battle of wits. Mm. A battle yeah. of wits. Yeah. Yeah. You get to partake in the uh, kind of like in the Friday quiz. It's, I mean, it's a numbers based thing. So anyways, oh, yeah. more info to follow next week uh, along these lines of investing and, you know, so on and so forth. TBD. And as always, we'll go deeper tomorrow. In the 201, our newsletter it comes out twice a week, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 to sign up for that. Always free. And we always go into depth and give you curated links to best sources all over the internet talking about the topics that we talked about on today's show. Whether you made it or missed it, it's always a great ride, the 201. Tight and mosey out to the back porch. <laughs> and, and, and Doug, I know you usually take the reins here on the back porch, but I actually have something specifically for you. Oh. All right. Yes. Okay. I'll hand over the wheel. Reigns. 
whatever vehicle we're driving now. <laughs> Before we get to that, I should just tell everybody that my son Nick and I next week going to be in Minneapolis next Thursday. We'll be in a town called Stillwater, not exactly Minneapolis, just outside of Minneapolis. Not Stillwater, Oklahoma. For details, Thursday night. At the Laugh Factory, you'll hear. <laughs> hey, come on down to the Riverside. <laughs> uh, but hang out with stackers and financial independence money nerds because this is going to be the night before we head out for Camp Fi. So a bunch of the Camp Fi people joining our local stacker community. Can't wait to see Chris and Veronica and Dan and Mike and all of our fun uh, stackers. Just making up names. Archie and Jughead. (laughs) (laughs) Billy and Tommy. (laughs) Timmy. (laughs) And little Susie. Uh, Stackybenjamins.com slash meetup to get your ticket to that. So we can uh, make sure that we've got room for everybody. So, so Doug couldn't resist. He could not resist. That's what she said. You see it right in front of you. You're a dude. You know it's annoying. You're like, I, 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 can't, I, I have to, right? I almost said it right I, there when you said you see it right in front of you. I tried to squeeze in. A, <laughs> that's what yeah. she said. It's exactly. And I've done that a hundred times. I get this stupid voice I do sometimes that I, I think is funny, and nobody in my family thinks is funny. And I know it's just super annoying. You're doing it right can, now. I was right? gonna say, is it the one you're using right now? <laughs> Damn, OG beat me. I, I walked right into that one. I'm gonna play this TikTok clip. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now we're just now we're off and running. I'm going to play this TikTok clip. I will say we are not going to swear. There's no dirty words in here, but I will say we had a president in the late 60s, early 70s who was called Tricky Richard. And so they're going to say that word a lot. Yes, they're going to say that word quite a bit. So if you've got uh, young ears, you might want to fast forward about a minute and play this one on your own. So uh, this is an Australian couple on TikTok talking about exactly what uh, Doug did earlier. So then my boss asked me to step into her office to talk about the Greystone account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really hard. Like my dick. She said that she was worried about how long it was going to be, how much time it was going to take out of my work day. I'm going to need to come early. Like my dick. Can you just I am trying to tell you about something important that happened in my day, and you are just being a pain in my ass. Like my dude. Look, I'm trying to legit have a conversation with you, and you keep shoving it down my throat. Don't you f***ing dare. God, okay, no, genuinely, I'm sorry, babe. Sometimes I use jokes when I'm in awkward or uncomfortable conversations. I know this problem feels gargantuan. And for me, the problem's just getting bigger and, and harder and... Sometimes I feel like I want to pull out. But then you can be so loving and our connection just gets even deeper. And he explodes. There's times, Doug, you just can't help it. You see it in front of you and you got to go. Yeah, it's an un- involuntary reaction. When your brain stops developing at 14 years old, you got to expect this. That's Stephen Carell, <laughs> man. <laughs> Although I have, well, I don't have 14 year old anymore. I have a 17 and 15 year old and they do not, they don't think that's funny at all. They will. Yeah. Give them time. They will. <laughs> give them time. Right. Yeah, when they're, when they're approaching 50, they'll think it's hilarious. Right. When you get older and your life gets more boring like ours is. You long for the gets, good old days. I think that's it. Doug, big show today. We, we start with John Holt Bright. We end with like my dick. <laughs> Tuck. On brand. <laughs> what should we have learned today? Well, here's what's stacked up on our to-do list. First, take some advice from John Hope Bryant. Help your community learn about money. And who knows? Maybe other social problems might fall by the wayside, too. Second, take some advice from our headline. If you're a new investor, take a cue from seasoned pros. They don't panic sell when there's a shakeup in the market, and you shouldn't either. Buckle your seatbelts and pretend you're on a roller coaster at Cedar Point. And remember, you got big plans and selling will wreck all of them. But the big lesson? I can't believe I can't copyright the phrase wind beneath my wings. Apparently, there was like a song by that name at some point. Maybe I should just leave on a jet plane. I don't know when I'll be back again. 
Thanks to John Hope Bryant for joining us today. You'll find John's new book, Financial Literacy for All, wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. And if you want to help John's cause and help the show, you can even purchase a copy from Amazon using our link. You're welcome. It's a really big book. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Joe gets help from a few of our neighborhood friends. You'll find out about our awesome team at stackingbenjamins.com, along with the show notes and how you can find us on YouTube and all the usual social media spots. Come say hello. Oh, yeah, and before I go, not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. 